like to sort of alert all of my audiences. I do have a minor speech impairment. So like pause. Um, I'm going to talk today about a, like a collection of um, of of a work ongoing with my students and my collaborators in the space of sort of how do you bring formal privacy guarantees into into the like uh, types of analysis that we like doing with our data. I want to highlight several of my collaborators, including my like um, former students, Eitan and um, Yulia, and my current students, and I'm Say Young, and my colleagues at um, Columbia, Marco and Michelle. Um, so I'll start by telling you what is the notion of privacy that I work with. Um, so this is called like a differential privacy, and it was defined back in a 2006 by, by like a Dwork, Mick Sherry, Seaman and Smith. I will note Dwork is now here at um, Harvard, so like an you know, excellent job you guys hiring her. And it says in pictures, it says this, if I have some particular database D containing data coming from many people, and I plug that into my favorite randomized algorithm, I'm going to get out a, a like a PDF curve of the outputs of this algorithm instantiated on this particular data set. And so now imagine what happens if I were to change one person's data, say, say, say that I change Alice into being Javier, and I plug this new database that is uh, the same except for one person's data into my same randomized algorithm, I'm gonna get out a slightly different PDF curves of the outputs of this algorithm instantiated on this new slightly different data set. And our privacy guarantee is going to require that if I like a look at these curves everywhere, they should have you like a pointwise bounded ratio um, everywhere along this x-axis. And you might think, why on earth does this correspond to a thing that we should call privacy? You're talking about like, you know, bounding ratios of the outputs of algorithms. And so now imagine this. Imagine there was this like a particular object output and like a publish as a result of this analysis. And so then some adversary wanted to, to infer, did I observe this output because of Alice or because of Javier? Well, then now this adversary information theoretically cannot make inferences about the differences between these two individuals' data aside from the amount allowed by the ratio. So now formally in math, it says this. If I have an algorithm M mapping from some like an N tuple of data into some arbitrary output range R, I'll say that algorithm is gonna be parameterized epsilon delta differentially private if it is the case so like uh, for all neighboring databases that are the same except for one person's data, and for all possible things I may produce as a result of the analysis, I'm going to produce that thing with about the same probability under these two neighboring databases. And so now if we ignore delta for a second, then we sort of like a recover our same like a requirement on the ratio of these two outputs. And we'll notice somewhat oddly that our privacy parameter epsilon appears in the exponent, which means you really want these things to be small. Otherwise, this guarantee will not hold very much. And as your epsilon grows a little bit, your sort of like a requirements about the information leakage relax exponentially. And now if we include delta, this kind of Kind of like a, gives us a little bit of slack because imagine if maybe like you know this value equals zero well then it's hard to like you know satisfy this for kind of any an epsilon or perhaps if it's just a very very small maybe having a sort of like multiplicative guarantee isn't quite like a, the right notion and so your delta gives you like a, a little bit of slack but again because we are bounding probabilities we want this delta itself to be pretty small much much smaller than than m1 and in practice people typically like it to be like a cryptographically small so now interpreting this privacy definition we have um formalized we're sort of saying i'm going to bound the sort of maximum amount of information leaked about any one person through this analysis and we're bounding it in a not so typical information theoretic way, which is this notion of sort of like a neighboring databases, worst case bounds across all databases and across all like outputs. But that's nice because it gives us a stronger privacy guarantee if we're saying 
no matter what you are worried about being revealed, no matter what data you hold, no matter wh what, what data you might want to like uh, pretend you hold, and no matter what data held by the rest of the world, I'm still giving you the same privacy guarantee. And so this is our sort of like, you know, nice notion of a privacy, but the question is like, how do we achieve it? Can we achieve it? And, and this notion works algorithmically by sort of like I'm injecting random noise into the algorithm. Um, and this is going to be the core of sort of like a, what we explored today is like a precisely how does that noise work? How does it affect accuracy of our results? If I'm telling you, first you have to optimize and then like perturb the results, all of a sudden you're no longer optimal. Should you be concerned? And if so, how, how concerned? And that's going to be our sort of like a theme of the hour. And I'll mention in the past uh, 17 years, there has been a very like a diverse algorithmic toolkit of sort of methods guaranteeing differential privacy that will also enable accuracy of the analysis. And these are, are um, used in practice. And this is now a sort of like a very much incomplete list, but sort of every major tech company and also certain like um government organizations use these in product. And so this is sort of no longer a new fledgling idea, but it really is like a common practice. So I'll first tell you a little bit about some of the like um, original tools. Um, and then I'll tell you how do we build like a complicated algorithms for the type of machine learning that we like doing. So our first tool is what's called the, the like a Laplace mechanism. And this effectively adds noise to sort of hide, hide like one person's data. And the question is, how much noise do I have to add if I want to hide one person's data? And so this um, notion, sensitivity, calibrates that. And it depends on sort of what are you trying to do based on the data? Are you trying to learn something very aggregates, are you trying to learn a mean over a large population? Or like, you know, are you trying to like, you know, count how many people named up Bob Smith live at this address? Obviously these are very different. And so the um, sensitivity of a function is effectively the kind of like a maximum change, change to like um, can be caused by sort of one person's data. And this is like uh, defined formally for a single real valued function to be the kind of like a maximum absolute change in the function's value caused by changing one, one um, person data. And I'll mention if you have like um, higher dimensional functions, you can like, you know, add your appropriate norm based on your analysis and use that instead of absolute. And the Laplace mechanism is very simple given this. It says, if I want to compute a function F privately on my data, I can first, I can first compute my true answer, and then I can add noise. How much noise? A plus noise scaled by this um, sensitivity delta f over my like a privacy parameter epsilon. And so the like a Laplace mechanism is not a very commonly used distribution outside of differential privacy. Inside of DP, it's like, you know, the first and the standard and the primary one. But sort of outside of DP, it's not very, very common, but it's effectively a sort of like a two-sided exponential centered around zero and it's tails decay exactly exponentially, which is nice because we have our, our like an epsilon parameter and the exponent. And so this kind of like, an exponentials to match each other um, to kind of make analysis nice. And so this like a Laplace di distribution, if it has a smaller parameter, it is pointier and it adds noise that is more concentrated. And if it has a larger parameter, it is flat and it adds noise of like a higher variance. And so now mapping this back into our terms, this says that if I have a large sensitivity, then I have to add more noise, which makes sense because if I want to hide something larger, I should add more noise. Like also, if I have a smaller epsilon, meaning that I want to provide stronger privacy protections, I should add more noise. 
And this is our first DP mechanism and it satisfies epsilon zero DP. So now you, you might ask, why do we use Laplace noise? No one does. In my analysis, I use Gaussian noise. Right, sort of like, you know, model everything as a Gaussian. Why do I have to use your weird noise mechanism? And you don't. And you can, in fact, also think about like a Gaussian noise. And so you are, again, going to like a compute sensitivity in the exact same, same way. And then you can add like a Gaussian noise and you're going to add noise again that is mean, mean zero and has a variance that, again, scales with like a delta F over epsilon. This is, and this is a kind of like an important ratio that appears everywhere, which sort of calibrates how much do you need to hide versus like um, how much privacy protection are you trying to um, give? And we have some like, you know, log terms in our delta here that, that appear because a Gaussian tail isn't exactly exponential. And so we have to, to, uh, to, to account for that with this additional delta term. And so like at the Gaussian, mechanism satisfies epsilon delta different ways. So we have two tools and they seem very simple and I've not told you anything yet about machine learning or about um, statistics. And so let's like uh, think about this and let's move into these more like you know, exciting um, problems. And we're going to um, see that our first two tools, although they are very simple, they're in fact like I'm um, incredibly useful in the type of applications that you want to um, do. And so like at the core principle underlying differential privacy is that you add noise somewhere in the algorithm. And so it has to be a kind of randomized algorithm. And the question is then if I'm adding noise, how will this affect accuracy? How will this additional randomness impact my ability to, to kind of like extract value from my data? And you might also be thinking what type of noise, how much noise and so on. And so we're gonna go through like a three short vignettes um, about sort of how can we use these like a basic tools and these um, definitions? How can we add noise into the like a types of things that we actually like to do? And the first is going to be the problem of doing like an online learning, like um, bandit feedback. And we're going to examine like a Thompson sampling, which is an algorithm like a developed in the 1930s and is in fact already randomized. And we will see this like a type of noise already works with the underlying like a DP requirement. Next, we're going to look at like a causal inference and in doing like a um, counterfactual estimation. And we'll look at some existing algorithms that again, have been around for a very lo long time and they're not private but they can be made private with some, some noise with like a very small loss in their accuracy. And then finally, um, we will look at the problem of doing sort of like an imbalanced learning where you have like a training data that is not like a balance across classes and there exists like a non-private methods for like I'm solving this. We'll see in some cases adding in like a differential privacy can really be a problem here. And it like uh, doesn't work as nicely as we might like. Our first vignette is going to be about like um, Thompson sampling. And this is going to be how can you harness already randomized algorithms so you don't have to add more noise? And I'll give a brief like um, like um, framing of the bandit case. I assume in an audience like this, most people are familiar, but it's important to still sort of like formalize everything. So, so like imagine that we're, we're in a case, we have N arms and the reward of each arm I is gonna be drawn from some unknown di di distribution DI with some mean mu I and you don't know this, but you want to learn. And each time T, we're going to like have the analyst choose an arm AT from the available arms and observe a reward RT drawn from this like a corresponding distribution of that R. The analyst's goal is going to be to sort of minimize regret over some like a capital T time steps. And this is going to be like a defined as they will like a compare what are their, what are their average reward they like received compared to the sort of like a best in hindsight, best if they had more information 
arm and expectation, the lecum could have been pulling the entire We'll start by talking about like a Thompson sampling. And again, this was like a defined in the 1930s and it is still used today. And it effectively says for each time T, I'm going to just like, um, like um, hallucinate a reward from each arm based on the information that I have available at that time. And I'm going to like um, hallucinate Gaussian rewards. And so importantly, rewards do not actually have to be Gaussian, but I'm going to like you know, hallucinate that they are. And the mean of that Gaussian is going to be my my kind of kind of like empirical mean I have seen so far. And I'm going to calibrate variance based on like a, the number of times I pulled that um, arm, which tells me something about the like a number of like um, samples I have. Um, and so this sort of like um, calibrates uncertainty based on my observed data. And I'm then gonna like uh, pick the arm with the best hallucinated reward and I'll play it. And I will then like uh, receive a reward and then sort of like um, update beliefs and proceed. And this algorithm is known to have um, regret square root NT log N. And this is in fact like a, the best that you can do under a certain very reasonable conditions. So this is our, our like um, goalpost. And the question is, this is already a randomized algorithm and it already has Gaussian noise. And so maybe we can think, is it already private? private? So let's think about, I was sort of like a doing this in one arm. So let's think about, is this already private? And let's think about, about sort of like in the case of one, Yes, it's optimal in the absence of privacy. And there's some like, you no, know, there's some kind of like a technical conditions on the underlying distributions themselves. For example, they can't have like, you know, a point mass very, very far away in the tail and things like this. And so this is like, you know, pretty reasonable conditions. Um, so the variance actually, this is a good empirical estimate of the variance because at this point in time, you have like a this many samples. You mean across arms? Yeah, you don't know things about the underlying underlying distribution. So you sort of can't condition on like, you know, I know that I'm seeing Gaussian noise. And so what's your underlying? Huh? Yes, because we don't have have a, like a parametric estimate of how the points are drawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you know, the fact that it is optimal, I think, made people stop. That's fair. So we have a thing where we are sort of already like doing something Gaussian and random. Can this be differentially private as is? And let's think about it just in the case of sort of one round and one arm. So recall this is our Gaussian mechanism. So I so I'm going to add like a mean zero Gaussian noise with some variance that looks like this. And what I'm doing is I'm is I'm effectively sampling a th theta i with some with some Gaussian drawn from this and I can basically pull out what is my mean and this is the like a value of my function and then I'm adding to some function computed on, on my data I'm just adding mean zero like a Gaussian noise with some variance and so this looks basically the same and we know in this case for for thinking about like a Thompson sampling Delta F equals one over the like um, number of samples I have seen so far. I will note in this case, I'm kind of assuming everything is bounded between zero one. If they're bounded in some other range, insert the appropriate constant there. So we're sort of already seeing things that look very, very similar. And if you do like a little bit of algebra, 
And it, um, it turns out this is going to be like an epsilon delta DP as an instantiation of the Gaussian mechanism for this like a particular epsilon. So this is great, but this is only thinking about pulling one arm once. And we actually want to pull many arms many times. So let's think about if I were to instead just again think about one round and now say, I'm going to pull this for all arms at the same time. And here is where it's helpful that we have a large literature of, thing, of things known to be differentially private already. So there's an algorithm that's, that is called report noisy max. And this takes in a database and functions with some given sensitivity. And then it samples Laplace noise. And then it reports the sort of arg max of these noisy estimates. And we're doing something very similar he here um, with a couple caveats. So, so we show that in fact, if we extend this algorithm into our case, it remains differentially private, but there's a couple important changes based upon our needs. First of all, we are not doing Laplace noise, we are doing Gaussian noise. And so that's important. Um, but then also, this existing algorithm assumes that kind of like all the functions have the same sensitivity delta. But in our case, each function's sensitivity is going to be one over the sort of number of times that arm had been pulled, which is of course going to be different across all arms. And so we show in this case, if you extend this also to include heterogeneous parameters in the Gaussian mechanism, then it's still, satisfies um, 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 differential privacy. And we show as a corollary, one round of this like um, of this like a Thompson sampling algorithm is basically an instantiation of this algorithm where the main difference now is that you have to think about sort of what is the like, um, what is the kind of largest sensitivity, which is going to be from the arm the like has been pulled the fewest times. And so it's going to be one over the smallest ni at that particular time time. So we're so we're sort of getting closer and we have like a utilized existing tools that are known to be private, but this is still just for one arm. But at least we can say formally Formally already, Thompson sampling itself is is like a differentially private. But but kind of like a, now we have to think about how do we uh, compose these across time, and I want to introduce another property that we all like a uh, love about a uh, differential privacy in 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 this field, which is if you are to run multiple differentially private algorithms on the same data set. And you're going to have like a privacy parameters epsilon delta are going to compose like a gracefully over time. And there's in fact many different versions of this and I'll give you a couple of them. And so if I have like a capital T T like a different algorithms and they're each epsilon delta different to private, then I can like um, compose them in a few different ways. I can first of all have what's known as like a basic composition we just kind of like, you know, add up all of your parameters. Things are pretty easy. And you get this like a capital T term in front of your um, epsilon, which is fine if you want to compose two or three things. It's not great if you're doing, for example, like you know, a thousand rounds of training. As I mentioned, epsilon is it's like in this exponent. And so you don't want it to be very, very large. So then we have improved notions. There's a thing that is like um, called advanced composition. It gives you a, like a dramatically improved dependence on, on T. T is now in a square root. But you have like a small loss in your delta here, here. And there's some other terms and some constants that are annoying, but it gives you like a dramatically improved performance in terms of T. But this is not, not like um, where the story ends. And in fact, 
And in fact, you can get like an even tighter performance using like a fancier thing. So I don't have the time to explain known as like a Renny DP, Gaussian DP. And these are sort of like a tailored for the special case of adding Gaussian noise because, because like that is what's commonly used in practice. And so we like um, empirically compared all of these. And so we have on this plot, on the x-axis, we have delta. On the y-axis, we have epsilon. And these three curves, regular DP, which is sort of sort of like advanced composition, is the green line. RDP is like um, Renyi DP on the orange line. And the blue line is like a Gaussian DP. And so you can see. Gaussian performs the best empirically. It gives you a, like a dramatically smaller epsilon. The scale, it looks like zero. It obviously isn't, but it's very close and you like that. But this comes at a cost, which is you're sort of losing interpretability of your bounds. And so rather than having things, as we saw on the previous slide, have things like T, square root T, um, you get this as your privacy guarantee. And I don't intend for you to read it, but I intend for you to be sort of like a confused and somewhat like a dissatisfied by it because you would like to say, how does it depend on T? If I wanna run my algorithm for T rounds, you get this and this is not particularly welcoming. So I'll mention this is sort of like an ongoing work. And one of the like um, things that we're thinking about is sort of how can we get more interpretable, like a closed form expression in terms of T. And my personal conjecture based on some work that came out last year is I believe we should get it down to log T, which is an improvement over the previous ones of T and like I'm sort of T. We'll sort of pause and change gears here and maybe hold questions for the end. Now let's like um change gears that so we'll talk about like um counterfactual estimation. And this is the case where um, 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 where we have algorithms that are not random. We, we would uh, like them to be private and we can add noise and hopefully this will not incur too much additional error. So the like synthetic control problem is, is he like, um, the like um, causal inference method used to sort of estimate the effect of an intervention. Um, and it is a, like a quasi experiment setting based upon like observational um, data in the form of a time series. And so for example, uh, there was a proposition 99 in like, um, in like um, California regulating cigarette sales and the like you know, information that must be included on the packaging. And we want to know how much did this affect. Um, um, and so in this case, we're going to learn from sort of like a sort of like a similar like a pre-intervention observations and then project a like a um, counterfactual outcome because you cannot go around and like um, collect data. What is the outcome that I would have observed if I hadn't enacted a law in the state, you can't observe that. And this becomes important if you're also thinking about like, you know, drug trials where, where like, you know, things are potentially life threatening, is it's like, you know, no longer ethical to give a placebo and just test. And so instead you want to use this kind of like a quasi experiment framework. And so like in this example, we're gonna have one, like a target unit, California, we want to, um learn about and we'll have a donor pool of kind of like a similar trend data across other states and the intervention is that we are like enacting the law in one state only and they want to like a predict predict like I'm counterfactually what is the outcome that I would ha have seen if there hadn't been some like intervention and and of course there's like you know many applications of this so our data is of this form so we're going to have a, like a donor pool on the bottom consisting of sort of like um, all the other states in this like um, running example. And for each donor, there will be, be a row corresponding to their time series. On the left, I'm gonna have all their like a pre-intervention data. On the right, I'm gonna have like all their post-intervention data. And the target unit, in this case, California, is gonna have, have it's also like, like a pre-intervention data and then it's like, and then it's like a post-intervention data we expect to be different. And so at time t, I'm going to have data from sort of like all the donors, and I'm going to try to learn 
relationships across states over time. And I'm then going to like uh, project that up into the like a uh, target. And so our findings might be something like this. And it will, and it will sort of emphasize this is like uh, from the original paper, not from our paper. And this is about like um, how it works before you add privacy. And so you might obtain something like this. And so then you can say in this blue dash line, this is my like a prediction of what would have happened in that state if we hadn't had this law. And then I observed this like a black line um, has my observation. I can, I can say like at the gap between these two is the effect of this intervention. And so now, now might think, how do I know it's because of the intervention and not just because you like had a bad pr prediction. And so then you can also do like a placebo studies on the states that like I didn't receive the intervention. And in that case, you would expect your like um, prediction to in fact match observed data. And I'll say in this talk, we're gonna focus on the latter case so we can really evaluate accuracy rather than saying, if we see something on the left, how do we know if it's because of noise or a bad algorithm or the privacy or like um, other things. And so we're going to be thinking about the case on the right where our goal is to in fact exactly match observed data. So now for the private algorithm is very simple. Sorry, sorry, non-private still. It's very simple is is you're first going to sort of like um sort of like learn the regression coefficients mapping mapping the like a pre-intervention data of the donors onto the like a pre-intervention data of your target um for example you can do your favorite regression step there and then you're going to like estimate y post of this like a post intervention donor data using using a, like a prediction um so back here so you're first going to like a uh, learn this relationship vertically and then you're going to apply it on this like a post data to then like a project this data using the same mapping onto y post And so this is in fact very, very similar to, to, to like I'm doing things like empirical risk minimization, which is just like uh, the first step. And um, and we have also tools for doing this privately um, um, where you effectively add just like a high dimensional Laplace noise to your F hat um, and then you're done. And then you're doing once again, Laplace mechanism. And there's some like you know technical terms on the loss function of like you know Lipschitzness and convexity and so on. But effectively, in this case, you can just apply um, um, noise to your f f hat if you're only doing step one, and this is no. We're not quite doing the same thing as 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 is done in these like um, other settings. Um, so so. It, so sort of like in a typical time series regression, you are trying to like a predict the same thing across time. And you wanna say for a particular observation, I have some data before and I want to predict what is this observation after. And so for, and so in this case, you want to get like you no know, privacy in the rows as well as like an accuracy in the rows. Whereas in, um, Synthetic control, we still require privacy of the rows because that is one single like you no know, donor unit, a person or an entity providing data. We care about accuracy in this vertical regression. And so this affects how do we compute sensitivity is we can no longer use the same sensitivity if we were doing regression this way. We in fact have to do it this way. And if we didn't care about privacy, we could say, we could say, just like you know, transpose everything and it's fine. But we care about these like a conflicting dimensions, and so if we transpose it, then we still have the same things arising. So we develop a like a differentially private synthetic control algorithm that looks very similar in structure, and I'll sort of like I'll talk you through how it changes. So we're still again in the first step, doing this sort of like you know learning 
learning regression coefficients. And this F hat is just the same as sort of like, you know, non-private ridge regression. Everything is um, standard. But I'm then going to add like a um, high dimensional Laplace noise. Um, uh, um, and so in fact, this case, in step one, it follows like, you know, pretty close to the like, um, to the sort of like original DP DRM, but the caveat that we have to think a whole lot about sort of like, what is our delta F here? And yes, good, good. This, this, this is it. And I'll mention that we also have to add noise in step two, because in this case, even though we have, have a, like a private F, we're then like a revisiting the data ex post, and that also requires privacy protections. And so we also have to add add some like a privacy there, there as well. So I'll just say that in this case, this like algorithm we show is has like an epsilon zero DP, and it like a produces an estimate with high probability is going to have like a root mean squared error at most this thing where the n is the like a number of donors which is small so you shouldn't be so worried about that um and t naught and t naught which is like at the time of the intervention and that can be big and you should be worried about that over epsilon but you also have this additional parameter lambda that is sort of like um tunable and this is your like um regularization parameter and so you can tune this effectively to be sort of like a or sort of like on the order of like t, t naught um and i'll mention that we also show show like um in the paper we provided like um second like algorithm and show the under proper parameter tuning both of them perform effectively the same as you like a non-private algorithm in this plot you can sort of see at the beginning um, they're going to like um, separate, but, but eventually they all like overlap. And so the green is like a, the algorithm I showed you and the orange is their other algorithm um, that I didn't show you. And the blue is a sort of like a non-private me method. And so we see once you like, you know, tune the, these things appropriately, they really get like um, the same performance. And in fact, our sort of other algorithm that is much more complicated, um, does like a perform even better. So now switch, switch, switch like um to my final vignette, which shows our first two have shown about how this is like really easy. Either it is random or you can randomize and sort of like everything works well. Um, but this one is to show you it doesn't always work work well and there are fixes. But you sometimes have to be a little bit more 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 careful, especially if you are doing things in a complex pipeline or a complex. We'll first start by telling you about the like a problem of doing imbalanced learning, which is when you want to do learning, classification, et cetera, on tasks where training data are very, very imbalanced. For example, if you want to like identify spam on um, Twitter, they made these um the like, gum um, slides before the number three percent was so like you know highly like a uh, politicized and contested but there's like you know, a very very small fraction also things like you know finding fraud and like finance or also like kind of like identifying diseases that are rare is you have one class and this is like a, the most interesting class of sort of like spam fraud a disease you really want to identify you just like don't have very much training data for it. And so the goal is to kind of like a learn a binary classifier using this like a um, highly imbalanced training data. And of course, the problem is that if you didn't account for this at all, I would say, give me a classifier that gives me very high like uh, prediction accuracy. Well, then I can just say all zero all the time. And that will give you very, very high like a uh, prediction accuracy, but it's sort of missing the most important thing you're actually trying to like unpack. And of course, if you're doing this with things like, you know, online behavior or, or like finance or like um, healthcare, again, you want to think about how can we introduce that privacy into this. And of course, this problem, like, you know, has been thought about outside of privacy a lot. 
And so if you're doing this without privacy, here's how this works. So you take in some data, highly imbalanced, and then you do some sort of like a pre-processing method, sort of like a reduce the imbalance. And then you plug this now balanced data into your favorite learning algorithm. It will then spit out a classifier and you are happy. And you really want to do this first step because of course, um, like in general, we're sort of like you know, interested in this pipeline in a case where the minority class is really, really too small for good learning. And so this is not, not applicable for the case of like, you know, 40%, 60%, but it's really for these like, you know, extreme cases in one of our data sets, we had like a thousand examples and, and like a 36 from the one class. And you just like, can't learn very well from like, you know, 36. Um, and then sort of like, especially if you're talking about adding privacy into this, it is known at the intersection of, of like a differential privacy and like a fairness, DP algorithms disproportionately affect minority groups and they have problems of sort of like, you know, amplifying loss on the minority class, magnifying existing bias and sort of like, and sort of like exists assisting unfairness. And while this is very bad, it sort of makes sense mathematically because like uh, the goal of these privacy tools is to hide individuals or even like a very small groups. And so if you're trying to learn but a very small group, obviously privacy is gonna be a challenge there. So the, so the idea is maybe we can like, you know, do something first, so kind of amplify the size of our very small group and make it not so, 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 so small so that we can apply all of our favorite like a DP algorithms. And one like, you no know, very common and very standard approach is to kind of like um, oversample the minority class to sort of like increase representation and you can do this by just like, you know, directly oversampling, or you can do it by some like a uh, fancier oversampling methods. One of them that is commonly used is called SMOTE, um, which stands for like um, synthetic minority oversampling technique. And in pictures, it looks like this. And I'll sort of like um, have some words up, but I think that like a pictures are the most helpful. So you have some like uh, points and they're imbalanced and they have some like, you know, blue points say that's majority and some green point or orange points and say that's minority. And I'm then gonna go through and I'm gonna sort of like, you know, for some fixed number of rounds, I'm gonna like a randomly select one of my orange points, find his K nearest neighbor is in the minority class, randomly pick one, and then generate a new point there's a random like um, convex combination between those two. And now I have a larger minority class. And I've sort of made sure, made sure that I like um, create points in the general neighborhood of my existing minority points, but I'm also not just like, you know, replicating existing points a bunch of times. So we might think um, we now have have like an amazing pipeline. We can like you know, plug in our data, oversample it. I can do some like you no know, your private learning algorithms. So we have like a bunch of those and then it will get a, like a differential private classifier. However, this is where things get sticky is that this is no longer a DP pipeline because our first step was not DP. So we're doing something that kind of like amplifies the signal of these points and I'm now promising I'm gonna hide the signal of those points later. And so obviously these things cannot like um, coexist. And one thing that's important to note is a differential privacy is going to be robust against post-processing. And so if I have something that is private and I publish it, no matter what you do to it, it's going to remain private. Um, and this is because of bits like you know, information theoretic guarantees, no adversary even like, you know, has enough bits of information to kind of like distinguish between Alice and between Javier. But this is not the case if we do pre-processing. And so instead we have to account for, for sort of like um, how much does my upstream amplification affect my downstream sensitivity. And so this is a part of our analysis that we do is we show in this case, if you have a sort of like an epsilon DP learning algorithm downstream, that's our C, and the pipeline where you first do smote, 
And then you plug in this sort of like a smoted data along with your original data into your like a downstream private learning algorithm. And if you think that you're getting epsilon DP, you're actually getting epsilon prime DP. And let's like a look at the difference between these. So you're getting an extra factor that is sort of like an exponentially dependent in your dimension, which like, you know, think of your dimension, even if you're doing a toy data set, it's like eight. If you're doing anything useful, it's like, you know, a thousand or more. Um, and so like, you know, exponential in that is not good. And then this is a factor of sort of like, you know, how many times are you kind of, kind of like I'm iterating through your, your, your points? How many times do you like I'm use each, each up? And so the main takeaway should be this is not good. And for a parameter that's sort of like a quantifies how much information is leaked about the individual, I do not want, want like an exponential, like a dependence on my dimension, which is presumably going to be very, very low. We also have like a very large delta here. It's unclear if this is even smaller than one, like depending on your details. Um, and so recall delta is your sort of like an additive bound on your probabilities. And so if it's even anywhere close to one, you're also sort of like not getting anything. Either. So, so this says you should be very unhappy about this process. And the intuition is in fact, like a changing one single point in your original minority class can change a very, very large number of the points that are like, um, generated as a function of it, which makes sense because you're like, you know, generating new points as a function. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tight analysis asymptotically. Um, um, there is some looseness in the constant that goes before uh, D, but they're still, so they're still tight dependent. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to kind of like, you know, tell you more about it afterwards. It's a cool tie into some like, you know, graph theory problem. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this like, you know, doesn't work if our first step is not DP for this exact problem. So now if we could have some sort of like a DP version of SMOT and then plug it into our private pipeline and by using like, like a post-processing here and then like I'm composition across these two, this would be like a two epsilon DP and would be a great. And I'm sort of at the very end of my time. And so I'll give you a very, very abbreviated version of sort of how we, um, do this. And it's almost like you know, embarrassingly simple. At first, we thought this would be a sort of like algorithms paper. And then it was so simple. They were like, this is a different type, type of paper. So we effectively grid the data into a histogram. And then we use the like a Laplace mechanism to like a privately generate counts of the number of points in each bucket. And then we use those as sort of input into our non-private smote. And now we're doing like a post-processing on our private data. And then our pipeline is good because sort of after that, everything is post-processed. And we show this leads to, to, to like a dramatic improvements, like a performance empirically compared to both like a non-private smote as well as other sort of like, you know, simple things you might try. And this picture shows you a, like a false positive rate versus a true po positive rate. And the red line is just sort of random guessing. Um, and you'll see all the other methods because of the kind of, kind of like an immense amount of noise that they add are basically random guessing, sometimes worse, not good. Um, and they're like a DP mode gives you performance meaningfully away from um, random guessing. We'll just sort of, con yeah. um, this is saying, this is saying if you want privacy in your pipeline, you should use a private pre-processing step. Um, um, Uh, 
Uh, uh, uh. So, so these are sort of like a both of all these methods plugged into a a like a DP cl classifier where you have to adjust sensitivity of the classifier as a result of this sort of like an impact of the upstream pre-processing and the and I think for for smote on sort of our like toy toy data set that had like you know eight eight um dimensions instead of having sensitivity one it was something like 20,000 and so like you're just adding an immense amount of noise to, to the point where you're really just having random noise So like a, just to sort of wrap up, so we saw the core idea behind DP is that you add add noise. And then sometimes you might already have have an algorithm that sort of is, is um, randomized. And then you have to just like a check, does it meet the requirements um, of DP? Now you might have an existing algorithm that, that, that you love that is non-random. And then you have to ask, if I were to inject the appropriate amount of noise, how would that affect accuracy of my outcomes? And then finally, doing, doing like a DP in a complex system can be complicated. And in particular, privacy guarantees are maintained through, the, through this like a post-processing and through um, a composition. They do not hold up against pre-processing. And so that's we want to be, be careful. One little caveat is you don't want to do do like a composition too many times um, because if it's too too large, all of a sudden, then you're like you know epsilon is going to become large as, as well, and so that's like you know a little asterisk.